Good morning, I'm Joe Fryer in New York. And I'm Zinclair Zamois in Washington, D.C., in for Savannah Sellers. Right now on Morning News Now, a difficult night. Breaking news out of Ukraine this morning, several people killed in a wave of Russian missile strikes across several key cities, targeting critical infrastructure, including Europe's largest nuclear power plant. We'll bring you the latest on Russia's most aggressive attack in weeks. Also this morning, close call. New developments in the brazen kidnapping that killed two of four Americans on a trip in Mexico. What we're learning about a fifth person who turned around before crossing the border. Hospitalized, developing this morning, Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell recovering in a Washington hospital after a fall last night. What we know about what happened, plus the latest on his condition. And away with words, he's credited by many for making reading fun. Now actor LeVar Burton of Reading Rainbow is working to shine a light on what some call an early reading crisis. More on his new project and why he says everyone has the right to read. Thanks for starting your day with us. We begin our show this morning in Ukraine. The country is dealing with the aftermath of the first major wave of Russian missile strikes in weeks. Ukrainian officials say more than 80 missiles were fired overnight, targeting infrastructure facilities across the country. Ukraine's Air Force says it shot down more than 30 cruise missiles. The barrage hit a number of major cities, including the capital, Kyiv, Odessa in the south, and Kharkiv in the east. Strikes were also reported in the western region of Lviv, where at least at least five people were killed. That's according to the local governor. He posted this video on the messaging app Telegram, which he says shows the aftermath of the attack. NBC News foreign correspondent Megan Fitzgerald joins us now with the latest on all, all this. So, Megan, what can you tell us about these attacks? Well, Joe, good to be with you. As you mentioned, we're just seeing a barrage of missiles and drones raining down across the entire country of Ukraine, something that we've not seen, as you mentioned, uh, in at least a month from now. So uh, we, we've been looking at uh, attacks in Kharkiv, the second largest city in Ukraine, all the way down in the port city of Odessa, uh, to the west in Lviv, also in the capital city of Kyiv. Now, right now, we know that the death toll stands at at least nine, but of course, uh, officials are saying that that number is expected expected to rise. Ukrainian officials saying several things right now. The first uh, is that 81 missiles, at least 81 missiles were launched um, and that they're seeing this pattern, this tactic by Russia uh, to launch a barrage of their sophisticated missiles first, followed by less sophisticated missiles and drones as a way to try and overwhelm Ukraine's air defense system. Um, but they do say that they were able to block at least 34 of those missiles. And as you mentioned, a typical pattern that we've been seeing throughout the course of the last several months, critical infrastructure being targeted, meaning uh, that people across the country are without heat and without power. We know first responders rushing to the scene there to try and restore power as quickly as they can. Uh, but again, we are looking at cold temperatures in Ukraine and a pattern by uh, Russia to attack critical infrastructure. Hey, Megan, we also understand missiles knocked out power to the Russian-controlled Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. That's obviously a tense situation. Yeah. What do we know about that? What's the U.N.'s nuclear watchdog saying about it? Yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, this is now the sixth time that we have seen the result of missiles knocking the Zaporizhia nuclear plant offline, uh, forcing it to run on those backup generators. We are hearing from the director general of the International Atomic Energy Agency expressing frustration that we are here yet again. I want you to listen to a little bit of what he had to say. This is the sixth time. Let me say it again. This is the sixth time that the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant has lost all of site power and has had to operate in this emergency mode. How can we sit here in this room this morning and allow this to happen? This cannot go on. And, you know, Joe, I know you and I have been talking about this a lot when we've been 
talking about Ukraine, I mean, the big concern here is that the plant now, Europe's largest plant, um, is operating on these backup diesel generators. It's our understanding now, according to the IAEA, that they have about 15 day supply of the diesel generator. The concern is if they don't get it back online and the diesel runs out, that is when we could be looking at a potential nuclear disaster where you're looking at radioactive activity uh, being released into the atmosphere. So certainly this is a situation that we will be monitoring closely. Yeah, Joe. a major concern that's hung over all this for months now. Megan Fitzgerald with the latest out of Ukraine. Thank you, Megan. Now to the latest developments in the deadly kidnapping of four Americans in Mexico. NBC News has learned from a law enforcement source familiar with the matter that a fifth person was on that road trip this morning. We're getting new details on that. And just last night, a vigil for the group was held at a church in Scranton, South Carolina, a town near the victim's hometown of Lake City. The community mourned the lives lost and lifted the survivors up in prayer. This could have been any of us. This could have been any of our children, any of our, it could have been my son or my daughter. So we didn't come here tonight to point fingers or judge anybody, but yet we're going to pray that God will hold these families, that God will bless them in this time. NBC News correspondent Ellison Barber joins us now from Lake City with the latest on all this. Ellison, good morning. So I know you were at the vigil last night. What exactly did you hear from the people who attended? Hazen Clay at Lake City, which, as you said, is the hometown of all four victims. It's a really small community. The population here is less than 6,000, so it's not hard to find people who know of the victims or know their parents or are in some way connected to them. This is something that has hit this community very hard because it is so small, because it is so close knit. What we kept hearing from people is just absolute shock that something like this could happen to people they know from such a small community. They say again and again that they are devastated for the families who whose loved ones went on this journey and then never came back. And they are also relieved and grateful that some of them survived. Listen. The connections are very, are very intertwined. We all went to school together. Lake City is a small community. It's just tragic. We're sad. The whole community is sad. Nobody could get any sleep. And we're glad for the two survivors. And we're mourning the deaths of the two that were lost. Everyone that we have spoken to, they say again and again that these four individuals, they were super close. They say even from childhood, you would often see all four of them together. They weren't surprised that they all had taken this journey as a group, as a unit. One person said she'd seen people on social media saying, why would so many adults be going on this one trip together? And she said, look, a lot of us have a Gullah Geechee heritage. And she said, what we are taught by elders in our community is that we stick together and we travel together in part for our own safety, but just because culturally speaking, this is a community that is very tight, that tries to look out for one another. And one person said to me, if I was driving 45 minutes, I would pick up the phone. I would call a first cousin and say, hey, I'm going to this city. Will you come with me? So they weren't surprised that they were all together, particularly these four, but they are absolutely shocked that something like this could happen to people they know. Sinclair. I mean, Truly shocking. And the big development now is that we know there was a fifth person who went along for the trip. Ellison, what information do we have on who that person is and why they were not with the group when the other four were kidnapped? So a law, law enforcement official who is close to this case is telling NBC News that this fifth individual traveled with the group but then did not cross into Mexico because she lacked the proper documentation. There is a Facebook Live video that one of the surviving victims, Eric Williams, who was shot in the leg, he posted on Facebook uh, at some point during this journey. And you can see that fifth person sleeping in the back of the car as they're making this long trek to Mexico. She has 
since identified herself in conversations, text messages with the Associated Press. She says that she stayed at a hotel on the other side of the border and that she was actually expecting everyone to be back within about 15 minutes. She said that she thought her friends uh, were going to take Latavia McGee to uh, get her cosmetic procedure and then come back to the hotel. She said she had all of their luggage at the hotel, but then didn't hear from them and started to get worried and notified local police that her friends had gone into Mexico and then had not come back. Zinclay. So devastating. A lot to follow in this investigation. Allison Barber, thank you. This morning, the toxic train crash in Ohio will be in the spotlight on Capitol Hill. Norfolk Southern CEO Alan Shaw is scheduled to testify before Congress today. And in information obtained by NBC News, he's expected to tell the Senate committee that he is deeply sorry about the derailment last month that has shaken that Ohio community. NBC News congressional correspondent Julie Serkin joins us now. Julie, good morning. So besides that apology, what else can we expect to hear from Shaw? Certainly, we can expect some very tough questioning, right? Absolutely, Joe. Look, more than a month after this tragic accident happened in East Palestine, we will finally hear from the CEO of Norfolk Southern, Alan Shaw, on Capitol Hill before the Environment and Public Works Committee in the Senate. And the two leaders of that committee, Chairman Carper and Ranking Member Shelley Moore Capito, uh, know that responsibility well, and they will use it in a press call with reporters Yesterday, Capito actually expressed her displeasure at the EPA. Uh, Carper said they want to get all the facts here to make sure this doesn't happen again. And Shaw will certainly be in the hot seat. In addition to telling lawmakers how deeply sorry he is, he will tell them that the company has committed uh, at least $20 million in investments to the community to help the some 4,000 residents recover from this accident they are still being impacted by. And he said this is, quote, just a down payment on what the, commu uh, what the company plans to do for the community. He also says that this is part of the company rebuilding their safety culture from the ground up. So that's just some of what we expect to hear from uh, the CEO of that company. You know, lawmakers will be asking tough questions, but the panel will also hear from a number of lawmakers whose communities have been impacted by this derailment. Senators, not just from Ohio, but also Pennsylvania as well. What can we expect there? Yeah, exactly, Joe. To set the scene of this hearing, the first panel, before we hear from any officials involved in the cleanup or the CEO of the train company, we will actually hear from both Ohio Senator Sherrod Brown and J.D. Vance. We will also hear from Bob Casey of Pennsylvania. Of course, uh, Betterman, his colleague, his counterpart, is in the hospital dealing with some mental health issues. So it will just be Casey presenting the case for the residents of Pennsylvania. He will say that, look, while attention has rightly been paid to Ohio residents who have been impacted by this, remember, this happened right along the border of his state, too. And he will share some personal stories of people who were affected by this there. So that will sort of set the scene before Shaw takes the stand. And Julie, the NTSB is already launching an investigation into the company. It's advised Norfolk Southern to start making improvements immediately. And the company says it is doing that real quickly. What do we know about that? Yeah, this is the first investigation that agency has launched in a decade. And they're saying that because of all of these accidents they've seen under Norfolk Southern, they need the company to come up with a better plan. And you see some of what Norfolk Southern is already doing. They are expanding its operation awareness and response program and the training of that regional center you see at that top. Well, it actually begins March 22nd. So the company says they're already addressing some of all of this criticism. All right, Julie Serkin. Thank you, Julie. Also this morning in Washington, Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell is in the hospital after suffering a fall. A spokesperson for the senator confirms to NBC News that it happened last night at the Waldorf Astoria Hotel in Washington, D.C. His spokesperson said he was admitted to a nearby hospital to receive treatment. In 2019, McConnell fractured his shoulder in a serious fall outside his Louisville home and had to undergo surgery. This morning, the results of a two-year-long review by the Justice Department are revealing systemic issues inside the Louisville Police Department. That includes allegations of years of discrimination against minorities. The investigation was launched only after the shooting death of Breonna Taylor made headlines across the country back in 2020. NBC News national correspondent Miguel Almaguer has more. 
scathing report from the Department of Justice unveiled a damning assessment of the Louisville Metro Police Department, saying LMPD has long engaged in a troubling pattern of discriminatory law enforcement practices. Investigators from the DOJ cited serious unlawful abuses, especially against black people. Some officers have demonstrated disrespect for the people they are sworn to protect. Some have via videotaped themselves throwing drinks at pedestrians from their cars, insulted people with disabilities, and called black people monkeys, animal, and boy. This conduct is unacceptable. The troubling 86-page report cites uses of excessive force, unjustified neck restraints, and the unreasonable use of police dogs and tasers. Officers also conducted searches based on invalid warrants, unlawfully stopped, searched, and detained citizens, and violated the rights of people engaged in protected speech critical of policing. The U.S. Attorney General specifically cited a specialized unit originally called VIPER. The unit's activities were part of an overall enforcement approach that resulted in significant and unlawful racial disparities. The two-year review into LMPD was launched after the 2020 shooting death of Breonna Taylor. The botched raid in which Taylor was not a suspect helped expose what federal authorities now call a pattern or practice of conduct that deprives people of their rights. I don't even know what to think to know that this this thing shouldn't have never happened and that it took three years for anybody else to say that it shouldn't have. The failure to protect and serve at the cost of community trust. The Louisville Police Department, which is not conceding to a pattern of constitutional violations, says it's revamping its training and support services for officers. The city's also working with the DOJ to implement changes. Meantime, after the death of Tyree Nichols in Memphis, the DOJ will review that police department's use of force policies. Back to you. All right, Miguel, thank you. Turning now to an NBC News exclusive on a story we've been covering for months. You may remember back in January, a six-year-old boy was taken into custody after opening fire on his teacher inside a Virginia first-grade classroom. Now, prosecutors tell NBC News that they will not seek charges against the six-year-old for the attack. Joining us now to discuss this is NBC News legal analyst Danny Savalo. Danny, good morning. So while the prosecutor has said that they will not charge the six-year-old, they did say that once they analyze all the evidence, all the information, they would, quote, charge any person or persons that they believe they can prove beyond a reasonable doubt committed a crime. So who exactly could that be in this case? And why is the six-year-old then not involved in that? It could be the parents. It could be anyone who is responsible for giving the firearm to the child. Uh, I did not expect them to charge the child for two reasons. Number one, even though they theoretically could, how would a six-year-old form the requisite intent and secondly, is a six-year-old competent to stand trial? And that really just tests whether or not the defendant can understand the nature of the proceedings against him and help his attorney. But the adults, to the extent there were any adults involved who participated in or facilitated uh, this six-year-old getting the gun, uh, they could potentially be charged. And Danny, hopefully, yeah, that child gets the counseling and the care they need. I know a lawsuit is expected to be filed on behalf of the teacher who was shot. What kind of lawsuit can be filed on her behalf now that we know the six-year-old is not going to be charged? Well, lawsuit's a different question. I mean, you could file suit against anybody who may have given the child the firearm. But in all likelihood, if you're bringing a lawsuit, you're going to want to find an insurance policy somewhere or a deep pocket to pay a judgment. And it's probably the case that the parents uh, don't have enough money to satisfy a judgment. You may be able to reach their homeowner's policy if they have one. So part of the challenge in finding someone to sue isn't always necessarily the person who's most responsible. That's our civil, uh, civil justice system. Uh, you can sue the person most responsible, but they may not have any money to pay a judgment. So the search becomes for any government entity or any private entity with an insurance policy or assets to pay uh, a judgment. And that means you have to do some creative uh, drafting of a complaint sometimes. So, Danny, if the attorney general does decide to bring charges against someone in this case, how exactly would they go about doing that? 
They simply determine who was the responsible party for providing the firearm to the child, uh, and then they can charge them with some form of negligence or, well, in the criminal context, negligence is really, it's a misnomer, it's more like recklessness. Did they consciously disregard a known risk in allowing a child access to a firearm? And that could be even in the home, possibly not locking it, any kind of risk that they were aware of uh, it was a substantial risk, and they consciously disregarded it. That is a form of criminal negligence. It's a little misleading because civil negligence is really just, it just asks the question whether your conduct fell below the standard of care, whereas criminal negligence is about consciously disregarding a known risk. It's a bit of a bug in the legal system that we have two different kinds of negligence for criminal and civil cases. So, Danny, as our legal analyst, what do you expect to happen with this case, with this incident? Uh, in all likelihood, I mean, it, law enforcement and prosecutors are going to try very hard to find an adult responsible because uh, they recognize, and I expected they would not charge the six-year-old, even though you hypothetically could. Uh, this is not a, uh, this would be a almost certain acquittal, even if the case went to trial. So, uh, it, you know, in the prosecutor's mind, somebody has to pay for this, and they will try very hard to find the adult to pinpoint which adult, if any, is responsible for giving the gun to this kid because uh, somebody has to be held accountable if you cannot hold a six-year-old accountable. While legally you theoretically can, practically speaking, what jury in the world is going to convict uh, a six-year-old? Important points there. Danny Savalos, thank you so much. The West Coast is bracing for yet another storm this weekend. Meteorologist Andy Lastman has more on that and the rest of your morning news now weather forecast. Good morning, Angie. Good morning, guys. It's been the story, right, for the West Coast all winter long. These atmospheric river events, lots of snow, lots of rain, and we've got another one coming our way. This powerful Pacific storm is going to start inching a little closer to the coast through the day today, and with it comes just a fire hose of moisture. We're talking lots of rain, heavy rain at times, and additional snow that eventually, as the system continues tracking to the east, will spread into parts of the Rockies. But let's talk about the concerns with this system. Flooding is going to be the main one. You can see already 16 million people are in, under a flood threat, including cities like Sacramento and as far south as Bakersfield. This does inch into parts of Nevada as well, Reno included in that too. Here's why. Sierra foothills, anywhere from six to eight inches of rain. Coastal ranges will see anywhere from six to eight inches of rain as well. This is on top of already pretty saturated grounds in some spots and additional snowfall. Uh, this is going to happen more like above 8,000 feet. We'll have maybe Maybe two to six feet of snow on top of what is already there. But let's talk about what's on uh, what's already there. We have 200% nearly of the average snowpack that we usually see for this time of year. So it's pretty deep. We've got a lot of snow that we're dealing with. And the, the current uh, snow level is about 3,000 feet. So after 3,000 feet is when you kind of see a really dense snowpack. But look what happens as we go through the rest of Thursday and into the later parts of your, of your Friday. We start to see this snow level go up, and that means there's heavy rain falling on a snowpack that is now going to melt. We've got warming happening. We've got flooding concerns that are going to take shape. Uh, and this is going to be something that we'll deal with here. Not just snow, but wet snow at that. That means that the, the structural issues we saw with this last storm is going to be another kind of situation that we see unfolding in the coming days. Meanwhile, more people in the northern plains and stretching to the Great Lakes are under winter weather alerts from a different system that's going to spread snow from Montana to Michigan. Eventually, we're going to see places like uh, Ohio and stretching for a little farther into Texas. Texas, dealing with the heavy rain and the potential for some stronger storms through the day today. Joe and Zinclay, this is eventually going to make it to the Northeast by the time your Saturday rolls around. We just keep waiting for everything to come from the West Coast. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> it feels like every week this winter. All right. Thank you, Angie. Appreciate it. Coming up on Morning News Now, turbulence on the tarmac, another in-flight fight, this time between two passengers boarding a plane. After the break, what we know about the latest in a series of violent airplane incidents. And new this morning, U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin touches down in Israel amid violence and protests. More on his trip when we come back. We're back with news of another disturbance on board a flight. This one, a physical altercation between passion passengers. It happened just as the acting FAA chief reiterated a zero tolerance policy for unruly behavior on board planes. NBC News correspondent Tom Costello has more.
Let go. Let go. It happened as Southwest 117 was boarding Dallas to Phoenix. One passenger began punching another, fellow travelers pulling them apart. Southwest says its crew helped de escalate the situation, coming days after 32 year old Francisco Torres threatened fellow travelers on a United flight to Boston. I will kill every man on this plane. Then tried to stab a flight attendant with a broken spoon as fellow passengers tackled him. We are now in emergency aircraft. The captain declared an in flight emergency. Uh, that person was subdued and is being detained right now, however. Not going quietly. One of the passengers who subdued Torres told our NBC Boston station, we had a hard time holding him down. It was total teamwork. Unruly onboard behavior has been spiking since 2019. Last year, more than 2,300 reports, many involving physical and verbal assaults. On Capitol Hill, the acting chief reiterated the FAA's zero tolerance. We will take every, every step to ensure that that the action takes place against any perpetrator. The nation's flight attendants are again calling on Congress to create a national no-fly list for bad behaving passengers. Airlines are banning passengers who act out badly on their airline, but that information is not shared with the rest of the industry. The FAA's zero tolerance policy means misbehaving passengers can face criminal charges and fines of up to $37,000 per violation. Back to you. All right, it's a lot of money. Thanks, Tom Costello, for that story. And Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin landed in Israel this morning, but his schedule has seen some changes due to massive anti-government protests. NBC News foreign correspondent Raf Sanchez is in Tel Aviv and joins us now with the latest. Good morning, Raf. So can you tell us exactly what these protests are about? I think you're in them right now. And were they intentionally timed for Secretary Austin's visit, or are we looking at a coincidence here? Sinclair, good morning. Yeah, we are in the thick of it, in the heart of Tel Aviv right now. That spiky tower that you may be able to see behind me is the Israeli Defense Ministry, and that is where Secretary Austin was supposed to be this morning. But as you can see behind me, the streets are absolutely full of protesters. There was no way the secretary was going to get through the roads here. The protests have nothing to do with Secretary Austin. He is caught up in the chaos. Instead, Israelis are out on the streets in their tens of thousands, protesting against this very controversial plan by Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu to weaken Israel's Supreme Court. And the people here are worried that this could be the end of Israeli democracy. I want you to take a listen to some of their concerns. I'm here because uh, democracy is in danger in Israel and uh, we have to fight for our rights. They're trying to take our rights away from us and we have to do something before it's too late influencing the people around him and eventually no one is elected alone. He, he also has a group and I'm pretty sure that he feels intimidated by what's going on. Zinkley, interestingly, we've heard from a lot of the protesters here that they would like President Biden to do more to put pressure on Benjamin Netanyahu to scale back these plans. Zinkley. Clearly, protesters showing up in full force there, Raf. So right now, the secretary has changed his plans, understandably, and is holding meetings at the airport. Who is he meeting with and what are they discussing? So he'll be meeting with Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. He's also meeting with the Israeli Defense Minister. And we're told by U.S. officials the message he's going to deliver is the U.S. understands that Israel's top priority is Iran. But the U.S. says they really need Israel to do more to bring calm to the West Bank, the occupied West Bank, where there has been so much violence in recent weeks. We're expecting the Defense Secretary to call on Israel to scale back these military raids they've been launching in cities like Janine, which have led to such high casualties, but to also to call on the Palestinian security forces to do more to confront Palestinian militants themselves. Raf, you mentioned those tensions at the West Bank. All of this, of course, is happening as those tensions have been mounting between Israelis and Palestinians. What's the latest there? Just this morning, Israeli security forces killed three Palestinian militants in the northern West Bank. They were members of the Islamic Jihad militant group. And just two days before that, Israeli forces were operating inside a refugee camp in the West Bank. They killed six militants then, including a Hamas operative 
who Israel says was responsible for gunning down two Israeli brothers at the end of February. Now, Zinkle, we are only two months into 2023, but this is already some of the worst violence we have seen in Israel, Jerusalem, and the West Bank in two decades. Zinkle. Well, Ralph Santos, thanks for your coverage. Stay safe. On Capitol Hill, lawmakers heard from leaders in the intelligence community yesterday who laid out the biggest threats currently facing the United States. NBC News Justice and Intelligence Correspondent Ken Delanian joins us now with more. Ken, good morning. So it seems like America's relationship with China was really front and center during this Senate Intelligence Committee hearing yesterday. What can you tell us about that? Yeah, good morning, Joe. China really emerged from this assessment and in this hearing as the greatest long-term threat to the United States. And what was really interesting is that these intelligence leaders said that China views its advancement as only coming at the expense of U.S. influence. In other words, a zero-sum game, which is really a recipe for confrontation over issues like China's efforts to absorb Taiwan. Uh, also came up uh, was this debate over whether the COVID vaccine uh, emerged accidentally from a Chinese lab. The intelligence community disagrees about that, but one thing they all agree on is that China has covered up the evidence. If there's any good news here, uh, they, the assessment was that Chinese President Xi Jinping wants stability for now. He believes that China would benefit from easing some tensions in the short term with the U.S., but long term, they see China as a big challenge. Again, another huge topic, our top story this hour, the war in Ukraine. What do officials have to say about Russia and the war? The intelligence leaders said that they do not see Russia making territorial gains in the short term, say over the next year. It's really tough going for Russia right now, even as they try to mount a massive attack and seize part of the Donbass region. But they also assess that Vladimir Putin believes that over the long term, he has a good position. Uh, the longer he drags this out, the better it is for Russia. So that's really a recipe for a long-term conflict with the U.S. continuing to invest billions and billions of dollars. Joe. And Ken, so many global concerns right now. Any other important issues come up during this hearing? Yeah, of course. And, you know, Iran, which got more attention in years past, continues to enrich uranium and is closer than ever to building a nuclear weapon. They haven't made the decision to do that, but they could do it at a moment's notice. And, of course, North Korea is essentially a de facto nuclear power now and continues to test and perfect nuclear weapons. So both of those countries pose a huge threat to the United States, even as China is getting most of the oxygen right now. All right. Ken Delaney and Ken, thank you so much. Turning now to Memphis, where a judge has blocked the release of footage and audio from the night Tyree Nichols was beaten by several police officers. City attorney Jennifer Sink was set to release 20 hours of additional footage on Wednesday after announcing the city completed its investigation into the incident. But attorneys for the officers involved in Nichols' death filed an immediate protective order. The judge ruled the information could not be released until the state and defendants have time to review it. It's unclear if the Nichols family has reviewed the additional footage. Coming up, sharing her story. Celebrity zookeeper Bindi Irwin opening up about her health struggles. More on the diagnosis that impacts millions of women all over the world. And the right to read. Reading Rainbow's LeVar Burton working to take on what he calls an early reading crisis. His new project next on Morning News Now. We're back and we're taking a look at women's health and a medical condition impacting millions of women around the world. Endometriosis affects 11% of women between the ages of 15 and 44. That's according to the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services Office on Women's Health. And now Bindi Irwin, Australian zookeeper and daughter of the late crocodile hunter Steve Irwin, is speaking out about her diagnosis to raise awareness. Irwin wrote in a social media post, quote, I'm sharing my story for anyone who reads this and is quietly dealing with pain and no answers. Let this be your validation that your pain is real and you deserve help. Joining us now to discuss is NYU Langone Endometriosis Center Director, Dr. Kathy Wang. Dr. Wang, thanks for joining us. So first of all, for those unfamiliar, can you explain what endometriosis is and how it impacts people who are diagnosed with it? Sure. Endometriosis is a condition in which the inner lining of the uterus is elsewhere in the body. So it can be anywhere. It can be on the bowel, could be in the ovaries, could be in the lung. Anywhere that it impacts, it will create significant amount of pain. and. Women oftentimes will also have problems with fertility and having trouble getting pregnant. So Bindi Irwin said that she'd been dealing with this for 10 years and she's not alone. Why is it that it can take such a long time to actually diagnose this? 
One of the things I've been mentioning, I think, throughout my entire career is that pain is not normal. And I do think a lot of women get the message that pain is normal. Even as a little girl, oftentimes when you have painful periods, you've been told that it's normal. So when, sometimes women are not seeking help and sometimes physicians are not taking it seriously and continue the message that pain perhaps is normal. And one of the things about endometriosis is that it's very difficult to diagnose on imaging. However, at NYU Langone, we partner with our radiologists and we have developed a new imaging technique for MRI that diagnoses endometriosis with accuracy of over 80%, which is amazing. And the gold standard is actually doing surgery on women just to diagnose endometriosis. In our center, we really believe that's way too invasive mm -hmm. to diagnose a condition. And doctor, you talked about surgery. I think generally there can be an assumption with menstruation pain that this is just how it is, right? It's just painful, but there are options, especially if it's endometriosis. So what treatments are available for people dealing with this condition to help manage it? We really have a multidisciplinary approach to endometriosis. We don't believe surgery is the only method. We do think surgery should be the last resort. You should have medical treatments as well. We have a pain therapist. We have a sexual function therapist. We partner with our fertility specialists. Oftentimes we would first start with medicine and if you fail medical treatment, then we will approach surgery. All right, Dr. Kathy Huang, thank you so much. We appreciate your time. Thank Thanks you. for joining us, Some important information there. It's National Reading Month and today we're highlighting the push to change how kids are taught to read. Actor LeVar Burton is still doing his part to help kids with his new documentary called The Right to Read. NBC News Now anchor Aaron Gilchrist has the details. What letter is it? Why? Yeah. A new documentary laser focused on a growing problem in America, what it calls an early reading crisis. When I first started teaching in Oakland, there were only two kids in my class of 35 who could read. In 2022, 66% of fourth graders in this country were below proficient in reading. That's according to the National Assessment of Educational Progress. 37% were below a basic reading level. We are in a scary place for most of our kids. LeVar Burton is an executive producer on the film. He spent most of his life as an advocate for literacy, dating back to his time as host of PBS's Reading Rainbow for more than 20 years. Burton says this documentary speaks to an urgent need. Kareem has been a teacher at all levels, principal on down. And he says in the documentary, imagine being in the Stone Age and you don't have any stone. Imagine being in the Bronze Age and you have no access to bronze. We're in the information age and our kids aren't getting access to the information because they can't read. Burton says that while the film shines a light on the problem, it also elevates what he sees as a solution. We were asking kids to memorize words and take their cues from the pictures as to what the words on the page mean. We now know that that doesn't work. The, the, the problem um, as as the experts see it is that we just we've been spending money in the wrong direction right and we can change that what you need is the phonics you need a really scientifically based approach to reading instruction burton says the right to read explains how a turn towards structured science-based reading tactics is creating better outcomes for children and he encourages parents to ask questions about what's happening in their children's classrooms Parents can ask their, their school board, they can ask their child's teacher, how are you teaching my child to read? Are you, are you using evidence-based curricula or not? Because if they're not, then there's a problem. And once you identify the problem, only then can you address it to fix. Our thanks to Aaron Gilchrist for that report. Coming up, teeing off dozens of world's top golfers gathering on the green for the PGA's Players' Championship. When we come back, a look at the competition and what's behind some of the notable names you're not going to see. This is Morning News Now. We're back now with some money news. Microsoft's Bing is seeing some success with the launch of its new AI chatbot. CNBC's Silvana Hanau joins us with this and more financial news. Silvana, good morning.
Joe Zinkley, good morning to you. Yeah, so Microsoft says Bing has tapped 100 million daily active users just a month after the launch of its AI chatbot. The company says one third of Bing's users are new to Bing and the same number have been using AI chat for the searches every day. Now by integrating AI into Bing, Microsoft has given the search engine a weapon to compete against Google, which has plans to launch its own chatbot, introducing a chat AI called Bard last month. Spotify has launched a new video feed for the app. It recommends music, podcasts, and audiobooks to users through short clips similar to that of TikTok and YouTube Shorts. The new feature called Previews prompts you to browse new content recommendations, and the clips are aimed at enticing users to save music and shows to their libraries to listen to later. Spotify says being involved in the moment someone first hears new content is ultimately the key to keeping them as a customer. Apartment hunters have seen little relief from near record rents in Manhattan this winter. Data from real estate firms Miller Samuel and Douglas Elliman shows the average rent on new leases was $4,095 in February. That's down just $2 from January. Now, average rents peaked last July and have held near that level since. That breaks with the market's traditional pattern. Costs typically drop in the cooler months as competition for apartments eases. Manhattan is the nation's largest rental market, guys. I can confirm everything you just said about Manhattan. <laughs> <laughs> it is not getting that much better. I'm Likewise. staying far away. I'm going to stand <laughs> the other side of, of the river. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. And here's something you don't often hear on our show. The, to golf now, the Players' Championship tees off today at Sawgrass in Florida. 43 of the world's top 50 players are playing in the tournament, but what might be most notable is who won't be there and why. Here to take a swing at this with us is Golf Channel contributor Ron Syrak. Thank you so much for being with us, Ron. So we'll get to that notable absentee in just a moment. But first, walk us through the importance of this tournament. Who are the favorites this year and who should we be watching? Well, first off, this is the PGA Tour's flagship tournament. It's played at their headquarters in Ponte Vedra Beach, Florida. Traditionally, it has one of the strongest fields of the year in all of golf. And the PGA Tour coming into this tournament's in really good shape because its best players have been playing their best golf this year. Uh, uh, John Rahm has, uh, uh, has won tournaments. Max Homa, Scotty Scheffler. Rory McIlroy hasn't won, but he's been in contention every week. And some fan favorites like Ricky Fowler and Jordan Spieth are refining their form. So the, they've, got, they've got their best players playing their best golf, and they've got everything trending in the right direction. Coming into a tournament played on an iconic golf course, TPC Sawgrass, a course that the fans are very familiar with. So, Ron, that's good news for fans. But as we mentioned, there's one player missing this year. That's the defending champ, Cameron Smith, the Australian player mm -hmm. ineligible after joining the Live Golf Tour. That is a huge topic right now. Many of his rivals who are participating said they hoped he'd be able to play. What do you make of this decision by the PGA? Well, you know, I, I think it was a decision the PGA Tour had to make. Look, the major championships, which are, are, are considered official PGA Tour events but aren't run by the PGA Tour, have all established a criteria in which uh, Cameron Smith's going to be able to play this year because he's a defending champion of a major. That usually gets you into the next majors for the next five years. He won the Open Championship last year. But this is a PGA Tour event, and as I said, They've suspended the live golfers from the PGA Tour, so it's only sort of consistent with what their, what their policy is. If you're not a member of our tour, if you have uh, chosen to rebel against our tour, then you're not going to play in our event. Uh, it makes sense in my mind that the majors have made their decisions to let the guys who've qualified from live play in their tournaments, but it also makes sense for the PGA Tour to, to block the live golfers. And Ron, just last week, I know the PGA announced a series changes, including things like increased price purses and smaller fields. These are pretty similar features to the Live Golf Tour. What do you make of the changes and how has the introduction of Live been beneficial to golf? Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see uh, how this all plays out. I think the first winner here is going to be, well, the top players are winners. Uh, look, the first time I covered the Players' Championship was 1988. Mark McCumber won $225,000. The winner of this tournament this week is going to get $4.5 million. That's a 20-fold increase over time. So, And that money is, is only increasing. 
Uh, what the PGA Tour has done by creating designated events, these are going to be big money events, they're going to have smaller fields, no cut, and it's going to guarantee that the fans are going to see the best players playing head-to-head -head against each other more often. Uh, not only are they, is that going to happen in the four majors and the players' championship, but it's going to happen in a half a dozen other events out there. Uh, so uh, that's going to be good. How the no-cut thing uh, fares in, in all this is going to be mm -hmm. interesting because that's one of the features of Live Golf is is uh, that, uh, uh, that there's no cut there. But uh, one of the things fans love about professional golf is the cut because it's not like in team sports. You sign a multi-year lucrative contract and then you're lousy. You still get paid. <laughs> but the way the mm -hmm. PGA Tour's business model, you don't make that cut. Half the field gets cut after Friday. You don't get a check. So yeah, that's going to go time. away for some events. Good time to play golf today. Ron, thanks so much. <laughs> Happy to be with you. And coming up, iced out. We're not talking about diamonds. It's a new kind of luxury item taking over TikTok. Yeah, we're going to explain the growing trend of designer ice cubes. Yeah, that's right. You're watching Morning News now. Welcome back. Gamblers and WWE fans alike could be in for some good news. The WWE is in talks with regulators in states like Colorado and Michigan looking to legalize betting on scripted wrestling matches. They're working with groups to make sure that there would be no chance of match results leaking to the public. If the WWE succeeds in its bid to legalize gambling on matches, well, I could open the door for gambling on other scripted events like TV shows. I'm intrigued by this, the scripted element of this, the fact that the results are sort of secretly known going into the match. Huh. That would be very interesting in the gambling world. I'm not sure how yeah. that'll work, but we'll have to see Definitely. if they can make it happen. Something to watch for sure, Joe. Thanks. And finally, at this hour, Ice Ice Baby. That's right. We're talking about a new form of luxury, Ice Cubes. Designer Ice Cubes are gaining millions of views on TikTok and a major following. So get this. The appliance company Bosch surveyed about 2,000 people and found that among those people, 51% say they're, quote, ice obsessed. That means they're consuming up to 116 glasses of ice a month. That adds up to more than 400 pounds of ice a person a year. So what exactly is behind this new trend? Joining us now to help answer that question is senior staff editor of the New York Times Cooking, Becky Hughes, who wrote about this. Becky, good to have you with us. Talk about this trend. Why are people so ice obsessed? How on earth did this come about? Sure. Well, Americans are sort of famously obsessed with ice. It's a bit of an ongoing joke. And when you go to Europe, if you order ice water, they'll call it American style. <laughs> um, that's because America has the oldest ice industry in the world since 1806. And so it sort of seems like the natural progression that if any company were to come up or any country were to commodify ice and make it, you know, an Internet trend, it should be us. So here we are. Um, and the TikTok hashtag Ice Talk has 950 million views, so it's a huge internet phenomenon. Um, the most popular of these videos are these ice drawer restock videos, some of which you can probably see on the screen, um, where ice obsessives film themselves stocking their freezer with 10, 20 different types of ice. And Becky, I gotta admit, I have actually taken part in making some of this bougie ice, and I can attest it is kind of good. But it appears people are actually making money off of it. You talked about you talked about commodifying it. They're actually selling cubes for about fourteen dollars a piece. Kind of wild. So talk to us about the business side of things. What makes ice so profitable? Yeah, I spoke to um, Leslie, the owner of Disco Cubes in LA, which is a custom ice company, and she makes these perfectly clear ice cubes, which getting perfectly clear ice is a really hard thing to do. Um, and she fills them with wildflowers or food or brand logos suspended in the ice. And those retail for $8 to $14 a cube, just for starters. Um, and people have those for parties, for weddings. That's a really popular thing right now. And also these TikTokers making ice videos are actually making money because they all are selling ice molds at the links in their bio. I thought a $14 cocktail was a lot of money. Now a $14 <laughs> ice cube to put in the cocktail. My goodness. So, Becky, we have seen everything from flour ice we saw there, hot sauce ice. We have less than a minute here, but walk us through some of the different versions of the ice craze. Anything you've tried? 
Yeah, the the ones that I think are the most interesting, I love the ice molds that are long stick shapes uh, because those fit in a water bottle. I think that's pretty smart. I love these coffee ice cubes for iced coffee, which I learned in the comments section of the story is actually not a new idea. I had one commenter say that their parents were doing that in the 1940s. Um, and I love the pebble nugget ice. Those make drinks really cold really quickly, and I love that texture in a cocktail. All right, the coffee ice cube, I might have to try that one. I'm not gonna pay $14 for it, but I might try to make <laughs> one at home. So, all right, <laughs> Becky Hughes, this is fascinating. Thanks so much for joining us this morning. We appreciate your time. Thanks. All right, that does it for this hour of Morning News Now. The news continues right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.